Ah, good morning. Good morning. All right, Tony, I've got a great show, as you know, planned for today. While folks are jumping on, I'm going to talk about some amazing sponsors. But before I get to the sponsors, let me say good morning and welcome to another Friday morning edition of Coffee with the Rich. I am your host for this morning's show. My name is Rich Brown. I'm a retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, corrections officer, and special operations officer. And we have a great show for you this morning. Of course, Coffee with Rich is brought to you by the American Warrior Society, as well as the American Warrior Show, which is America's number one self-defense podcast. And the people that pay to keep this show on the road are amazing sponsors like Precision Holsters, Precision Holsters makers of the Ultra Appendix holster that I use. I carry my Glock 26 in every single day. It is an amazing holster, as well as the competition line. I'll be teaching several classes in October and November, and I'll be using the competition holster by Precision Holsters, as well as their tactical belt. Check out everything that they have to offer. They're a veteran company <clears throat> making amazing U.S. products. Please check them out. The easiest way to find all of our amazing sponsors is to click the American Warrior Show link. It'll take you right to our uh, page for the American Warrior Show. Hundreds of podcasts with amazing guests like T Tony on today's show, but you can also get deep discounts. <clears throat> we also have sponsor Mountain Man Medical. We have the co-branded American Warrior Society co-branded trauma kit. There are reviews on the trauma kit, unbiased reviews, you can read all about it, but I tell you right now, to get them the quality products that are in that trauma kit, you're going to be hard pressed to find it at a better price point. So please check out Mountain Man Medical and our co-branded trauma kit on the links in today's show notes. We also are sponsored by the Cool Fire Trainer. Why dry fire when you can cool fire? The Cool Fire Trainer will take your dry fire game to the next level. It's your gun. It's your sights. It's your trigger. It's your grip panels. Everything. It's your gun all you have to do is replace the barrel and the recoil spring and you will have an amazing dry fire training tool because right now ammunition is this is insanely expensive actually to be fair it's coming down a little bit but the cool fire trainer is on a two-month backlog just to get one in your hot little hands please check them out we also have as our one of our chief sponsors is appalachian standard makers of the finest cbd products money can possibly buy my good friend jesse ross he and i were in the marines together he's an amazing human being and an outstanding marine and he's making some amazing cbd products in the uh, beautiful mountains of appalachian north carolina century martial arts the final final sponsor i want to talk about this morning i'm looking over there at the bob in the corner maker of the bob xl which is an amazing striking opponent you can do much more with just Bob. Work your hand strikes, your legs, leg kicks. You can take it to the range and use it as a three-dimensional target. Bob is an amazing tool. Like I've said before, you could actually put a gi on Bob, a jacket on Bob, put him on the ground, do a little ground and pound, work your lapel chokes, etc. Want to work on that lateral vascular neck restraint that seems to be outlawed everywhere? You can do that as well. We got 23 folks joining us this morning. Tony, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Well, it's an honor to have you. Let me read Tony's impressive bio. Tony, am I mispronouncing your name? Tony Delaney? Yes, sir. Tony Delaney was raised in a small rural farm town in East Central Indiana. He grew up shooting and hunting small game at a young age. Tony began his career in public service in the mid-1980s, starting as an emergency medical technician for the county's 911 service and becoming an advanced EMT not long after. Along the same time, he became a deputy town marshal for a small department, eventually becoming the assistant training officer for that department and serving on the city slash county's combined SWAT hostage rescue unit as a tactical medical officer. During that time, Tony performed the roles of entry team all the way to counter sniper. <clears throat> Tony began studying martial arts in the 1970s at the age of five years old. He learned under some of the best instructors and practitioners at the time, including Mr. Glenn Keeney. Ross Scott, Bill Superfoot Wallace, shout out to you, Bill, an absolute legend, and many others. His martial arts training spanned several decades and included traditional Okinawan karate, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, and boxing. Fulfilling a need to serve more than just his community, Tony joined the United States Marine Corps late in 1989. He was honorably discharged of the rank of sergeant in 1994. He continued his work and studies as an EMT and as a paramedic during and after the Marine Corps. He also became an instructor trainer in basic cardiac life support, instructor for advanced cardiac life support, and basic trauma life support. 
Tony has been mentoring and instructing firearms for many years. He's also a competitor and has competed in high power service rifle, long range precision, IDPA, USBSA, two gun, three gun. Tony was the match director at a local uh, club for high powered service rifle and long range precision for over 12 years. Currently, Tony resides in Brunswick, Georgia, and is the owner of Fast Group, LLC, Farm Services and Training. And once again, Tony, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Welcome to everybody that's joining us this morning. Yeah, let's see. We've got 25 folks joining us. Please like and hit that share button. Got a great show for you. Let's see. we got Gerald is on. Uh, great to have you on, Jared. Good to see you, brother. Hope you're doing well out there. Robert is on. Roger is on. Walt, my brother, Jeff Brown. Good morning, sir. James is on from West Virginia. Greg is on, says, good morning, Rich and Tony. Greg is out there in Texas. He's coin number 2060. If you want to know what a coin number is, you're going to have to check out the American Warrior Society. Mark is on. Mark Few, good morning, brother. Mm. Shooting performance. That means Mr. Mike Seeklander is on. Brett Parker is on. Karen, Paul, make sure you post. Let me know where you're from. Let me know what your coin number is. And please hit that share button. So, Tony, what does that impressive bio overlook, sir? Uh, well, probably a lot of things. It's, uh, you know, bio, basically like a cover page for a resume, it just kind of omits everything that's, that's in there. Uh, probably one of the, one of the big things is, uh, we're pretty much, uh, pretty big into prepping, if you will, you know, if they call it prepping, uh, uh, licensed amateur radio operator. <clears throat> so do a lot of that. Again, that's to me, Communication is just another part of, uh, of prepping, uh, being able to communicate when when things go down. Uh, I was doing a lot of listening when the hurricane went through and uh, just recently in Louisiana, Ida. And there was a lot of debt set up trying to get information to and from people out of that area without power and so forth. So, uh, you know, we do a lot of things as far as food. Part of our business is uh, we're just getting into freeze dried foods and trying to get those out there uh, on the market. That's part of what you do with your, with your company fast group. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, it's recent that. addition to what we do is, uh, is freeze dried foods. Okay. Wow. We need to talk offline about that. That's <laughs> um, um, yeah. Okay. Wow. Right there. That's, that's our biscuits and sausage gravy. Oh yeah. I got to pick up some of that. I, I can't uh, I can't make it through the next apocalypse without some biscuit and sausage gravy. <laughs> I, I'm not being uh, hyperbolic. I'm, I love that stuff, as any good Southerner would. So uh, how did you get into, let's talk about the Marine Corps, and I also want to talk about uh, how you got into competitive shooting. But before that, you know, you here you are, you're serving your community. You know, no one can question your patriotism at that point. You've, you've been, a, been a cop, been an EMT. Why join the Marine Corps? that point it, it was uh well to, truth be told when i was 18 i almost joined the army Ooh. yeah i almost went out on an airborne ranger uh contract but uh i actually owned a house and uh went through meps all that kind of stuff they tried to get me to swear in i'm like no I, my agreement with the recruiter was once i get my house sold i'll, I'll be back well that never happened <laughs> so actually i was still uh still working on a farm at the time uh, just right out of high school. And, and so it's something I always wanted to do. And then when I get, when I, when I got on the SWAT team and my current martial arts instructor, who was also my team leader on the team was a, a recon Marine. So it just kind of, you know, brought that back up. And I was married, but it was like, you know what? I'm, I'm fixing to turn 25 and, it's either now or never. So, so I went. And what, what was your MOS in the Marine Corps? <laughs> That's kind of a funny story. So I walk into the recruiter's office, sit down with a, a staff sergeant, and we're talking. I'm giving him my background. I, you know, currently what I was doing, I was doing all of that. Uh, now I jumped out of planes. I, you know, we were doing cast recoveries in the lake all sorts of stuff because that was pretty much how we trained that's how uh george trained us was you know from his marine corps training sniper all this kind of stuff and i'm like you know i think i want to go you know i get a recon scout sniper school mp school something like that meanwhile there's this guy in uh, pt gear sitting on a couch behind me i had no idea who he was 
turns out he was the gunny in charge of the substation. And he said, uh, he said, what do you know about electronics? I said, well, it changed the battery in a flashlight, you know, a couple of times. I said, well, let's, you know, let's get you uh, taking ass back. So lo and behold, he convinced me. He said, look, you're going to be able to do all that fun stuff you want to do in the Marine Corps. Every Marine's a rifleman. You can do all that stuff. You know what? Let's get a technical school behind you. Hey, what do you do? You follow the recruiter's advice, right? So they sent me to avionics to become 6433. <laughs> and I never did get to do any of the rest of that fun stuff. <laughs> while I was there, but, uh, there was a couple of, a couple of good things that happened in there. I was actually, uh, and all this was, was unofficial stuff, but, uh, I had a good friend of mine. And I know you were at Lejeune. We're probably there about the same time. Oh yeah. I was there 89 to 95. And I got there in 90 and then left in 94. Yeah. When I first got there, I lived in Swansboro, <laughs> way down South of, and of course, I was stationed in New River. That time you had to go all the way around. That's a long haul right there. Yeah. But uh, so a neighbor of mine in the apartments we were at, he was with Second Force Recon. We used to do a lot of shooting together, uh, a lot of that kind of stuff. And he was on a direct action platoon. Mm -hmm. And he really kind of hated it because the direct action platoon and recon was tasked with their hostage rescue portion that they mm -hmm. were just getting into. And I was able to teach Second Force Recon our bus assaults that we did on the SWAT team. And, which, oh, wow. and with a few modifications, they adopted that, that policy. So that was, it was fun to do, but nowhere does it say that in my SRP. <laughs> but it was still, you know, good time to be able to do those little things. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh yeah, the recruiters, like uh, T.C. Fuller says, Marine recruiters are notoriously sneaky devils. Shifty. Yes, yes, they are. They bear watching. And I'll tell you, having been a recruiter myself, I never I never wanted that uh, someone to come up because I had recruiters that saw my ASVAB scores and assumed that, uh, you know, oh, wow, you know, Rich, you could like the first Navy recruiter I talked to before anybody, you know, and I was looking at Naval Special Warfare like any kid that watched Charlie Sheen jump through windows and shoot people in the face back in the, in his oh, yeah. movie, Navy seals. And my dad had been a sailor. So I'm like, okay, I'll go talk to the Navy first. And, and if the guy would have just shut his mouth and let me sign the NSW contract, I probably would have chipped paint for the next four years and moved on. Out of a boat. <clears throat> yeah. But, but he didn't, he kept going, Oh, you need to be a, a Navy nuke. You know, you're, you're going to work on a nuclear reactor and a submarine. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> uh but uh, anyway how did you get into competitive shooting uh tony and tell me you know what do you think the benefits are it really it really stemmed from when i was on the swat team we used to teach a school every year and uh have a lot of a lot of teams from around the region even out of ohio we even had uh, the ranger squad come and train with us for a week and during that week one of the things we would do would have a would be to have a two man team handgun competition. And so I really enjoyed that. In fact, me and my partner uh, won that about two weeks before I left for boot camp, the last, last school that we taught. So that's where it really stemmed from, but there wasn't a lot of, I had no idea what IDPA was. I don't know if USPSA was even around during that time. So that's kind of where it stemmed from. And then it just, uh, and also, you know, doing the long range precision and then being in the Marine Corps, uh, you know, I thought I knew how to shoot a rifle till I went to boot camp. And I had, uh, I'd always known about Camp Perry. I always wanted to compete in the nationals and, you know, I was a high expert, but, uh, it was just, I was never allowed to shoot in the division matches to even get a chance to go there. So it was after you know, once I got out of the Marine Corps, that's when I started really looking and I was, uh, you know, helping other people learn to shoot or mentoring guys that, you know, were shooting, but just didn't really know what they were doing as much as they should. And it just stemmed from there. And I finally, you know, was able to get into the high power competition, travel around to 
a lot of state regional matches. Uh, went to Camp Perry several times to shoot the nationals. And then, uh, you know, shooting precision, you know, long range precision matches. And then IEPA, USPSA, when I found them here locally. And so I'll just snowball. Uh, yeah. I was going to ask you this, Tony, do you find it difficult to, to toggle back and forth, if you will, from, <clears throat> you know, running a gun in USPSA to long range precision, or is that an easy transition? For me, it was easy, I guess, because I had just been doing it for so long. So, and there's a, yeah, I guess, and I'm not great at either one. I, you know, I'm fairly decent at all of it, but I'd much rather be that, jack of all trades and an expert in one, I guess. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I guess for a lot of people, because it is especially, especially service rifle, high power service rifle is just such a totally different game. I mean, it is nothing more than a competition of the basic marksmanship fundamentals. That's all it is, mm -hmm. you know, breath control, you know, your natural point of aim, trigger, trigger press, you know, that's all you got to do is just stand there and, and point at a bullseye and pull the trigger. Obviously, you know, USPSA or IDPA, you're, you know, you're drawing, you're doing magazine exchange, you're under time, you know, you're running here, running there. So I guess uh, I think a lot of people have, if, if that's, if high powers their game, they probably find it a little difficult to, to do both. Yeah. Um, as far as your time as a law enforcement officer and a SWAT operator, what advice would you give today in 2021 to, to that new, to that young starry eyed person that wants to get into law enforcement? Tony, what, what advice? You know, this was, uh, to, it's going to sound really bad, but when I, I was looking at the question last night, first thing that came to my mind was don't. And it's, it's, it's difficult to, to have that opinion because we need good law enforcement officers. Obviously we do, but in the environment that they're working in today, uh, it's everything's everything's nobody has their back other than maybe their partner on the street. That's it. Their department doesn't have it. The public doesn't have it. Uh, the administration, the politicians, the politically motivated prosecutors don't have it. They're taking away, uh, uh, what is it, qualified immunity? Yes, sir. I think, yeah. you, I think guest you had on last week was talking about his department. He'd been on for 23 years or something. Yeah, the, the state of New Mexico revoked qualified immunity for a police officer. Right. And, and, you know, he was like, oh, I, you know, that's not a, a line in the sand for me uh, or for him. For me, it'd be absolutely, I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, look at, you can just look in the news uh, of what they're doing. The other piece of advice, honestly, is uh, if they're dead set on doing it, read Dr. Fuller's book. Yeah. You look know, at that I, shout out for Dr. Fuller. Absolutely. He, <laughs> yeah. You know, I just, I finished reading his book uh, and it's, it, he's very, he's got some really good, strong opinions and, and they're good. You know, that's uh and we've all known it for years. Some of the worst shooters are law enforcement officers. Yeah. You know, they, they may do it once a year. And that's it. They've never shot a gun before the Academy. And the only time they're going to shoot is when the department tells them to go qualify. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a fact, you know, I, and I, I tell you what, it's the same thing for the, not just shooting, but for jujitsu, for jujitsu. Um, Thankfully, some cops are getting into it now, but, you know, here in the Cumberland County where I live in Tennessee, um, there's one jujitsu school and there's not a single corrections officer, or law enforcement officer that trains there. None. And I just I think that's insane. It just doesn't. I mean, they'll go to the golf course on the weekend. I get it. You want to have a hobby and get away from it a little bit. But uh, you all should also want to go home safe to your family as well as not hurt those that uh, in your community community that you have to arrest. Dr. Dr. Fuller says you were too kind, sir. <laughs> it's uh, it's not being kind at all. It's a, it's an excellent read, but uh, you know, to your point there about jujitsu, um, 
you know, you made a good point about uh, martial arts and you've made it several times that some of these martial arts schools that you go to, man, what their instructor is, is telling them to do is, is going to put them in prison. Yeah. And I know things have changed now, but I, I know some guys that, uh, some guys that I served with, some guys I've known a long time that are still in law enforcement. Some of them were, were getting training outside of their department and they actually uh, got a little bit into a bind because they were being taught obviously techniques that weren't approved policy of their department. And if they were to ever use that, then they're going to be considered operating outside of their department's policy. Yeah. And I, that really, that caught me off guard because I, you know, when I was a defensive tactics instructor, when I was still in law enforcement and honestly, what, you know, back in those days, a lot of that stuff came straight from martial arts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I don't think like I, I have a good friend who's a defensive tactics and trainer as well as a BJJ black belt. And and he, he when he trains law enforcement groups, he's like, look, I'm going to show you a series of tactics or a series of, of uh, things that you can do. I don't I have not sit down and read your defensive tactics policy, nor am I going to. I'm going to show you these things. You decide if they're applicable or not. And that's kind of his get out of jail free card because there's mm -hmm. so much nuance out there. Like you said today, nobody's got your back in law enforcement. So you really have to be careful. Let's welcome some folks to the show. Tony William is on. Good morning. He's out there in Irvine, Texas. Guile from the Philippines. He says, good morning, Rich. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, everybody. Sorry. I'm late. Just woke up from my shift. We're so glad you're here, Guile. And I know that you're out there uh, working to save people in COVID and God bless you for it. Brian Wall is on. He says, good morning from Little Rock Coin, number 2031. Gal says, good point, Rich. Most officers in my area are not really into hand-to-hand -hand combat or self-defense. They, we should train to be also a weapon aside from carrying a weapon. And, and that is spot on, man. We've said that many times, and I think some people probably roll their eyes metaphorically or literally in that. I am the weapon system. It's like, okay, come One on. Mind any weapon? Yeah. But I mean, in reality, you know, I've, I've talked about it before. I'll, I'll tell it one more quick time. You know, I saw, uh, it was a riot that kicked off in, uh, in a, in a pod that I was working. And this inmate who had San Quentin tattooed across the stomach, lifelong career criminal, he's mopping the floor. And as soon as, as soon as the uh, violence kicked off, he snapped that broom in half. And, and got busy. And I mean, he, he didn't hesitate. It wasn't like, man, let's see, I got a broom here. What can I do with this? It was like instantaneous. Mm -hmm. And uh, it goes back to your, what you just said, Tony, one mind, any weapon. Jared says, good morning, gentlemen. Dr. Fuller says it has um, always amazed me how hard your average Joe will work to win a plaque or a plastic trophy in shooting or martial arts competitions. While so many Leos will put in zero effort in those areas, which could save their lives. Absolutely right. That's yeah. I don't get it. Do you? I, I don't. Uh, I really think it's. Uh, I think they learn it from the departments because the departments don't put in. They don't consider that uh, a, a good return on investment. You know, everybody knows that. You know, ninety something percent of law enforcement officers are going to go their entire career never touch their gun except during qualification. But the ones that do have to go to that gun, they better know what they're doing. Uh, nobody, I don't think anybody's ever died from a paper cut or filling out, filling out an accident report incorrectly. But being in a gunfight, you can definitely lose. And if that's the area that you spend the least amount of your training, but it's the one thing that will end your life or mess you up pretty bad in a heartbeat. You know, how, how long does a gunfight last the rest of your life? Exactly. Yeah. And I'll tell you another thing, you know, you said won't touch their gun in an entire career. Well, of course, you and I both know that's not true. They may not fire their gun in their career, but I was surprised when I was a cop. I don't know about you, Tony, how many times I had my gun out, you know, on a weekly basis. That gun is, is out and at the ready a lot more than most people would presume. I didn't pull the trigger on it, but it was right. ready, you know? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, as far as actually being in that in that gunfight, you know, most will, yeah, like you said, most will never discharge their 
their firearm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, typically, you know, when that happens, uh, a lot of times you've, you're already behind the power curve because now you're trying to outdraw a drawn weapon. Yeah, that's, uh, and you got physics and a whole lot of other things against you at that point. Yes, sir. Uh, you have a great deal of instructor time, Tony, you know, going back to whether it's law enforcement or uh, your medical uh, training. What makes a great instructor, in your opinion? Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, they have to have passion to teach. That's, that's, that's one thing. And it's a good thing. You do, you do have to, to want to, to be able to teach people. The biggest thing I think is you have to have that ability to get your knowledge into the students that you're trying to teach. I shoot with and know people that are a heck of a lot better shooters than I am, but they couldn't teach a person how to shoot to save their lives. They're just not teachers. You know, they don't know how to how to uh how to get that knowledge across to someone it's like you know I, can't, I can do this but i can't show you how to do it i can't tell you how to do it so i guess you know it's that want to uh to teach you also have to know what you're doing to to teach i mean you don't have to be the best but you've got to have a good working knowledge um you know it was uh I've, I've had a lot of good success over the years teaching, and I really think that it came from my early beginnings in martial arts and the way we practiced back then and trained. Um, I kind of followed the same, the same thought process, and I learned many, many years ago uh, from Mr. Glenn Keeney. He's like, I would much rather you do this technique, whatever it was, front snap kick, you know, side kick, whatever, do this, you know, because – you're going to be in class, right? We're going to do 25 roundhouse kicks or, you know, whatever. Uh, and, you know, it's late in the evening or whatever, and you're tired and you're just kind of throwing your leg out there. He came over one time, stopped me, and said, look, I'd rather have you do this 10 times perfect than 100 times wrong. That's right. Because all you're going to remember is, is the wrong way. So I've always had that in my mind. It wasn't until uh, I, I read uh, Dusty Solomon's book, building shooters several years ago it's like wow this is kind of why i i was having some success because i learned that i was kind of doing things the way that the brain learns and uh, just reading his books uh mentoring shooters uh on training they've really helped me understand a lot more how that works and i'm trying to tailor that into my new lesson plans to to get to be even better than that so that you teach the way the brain works so they can retain what you're, what you're trying to get across to them. Yeah. Is there, is there advice you would give to a, a new instructor? It would be just that. Um, always number one, I don't care how good at anything you get, you should always be a student first and foremost. You know, you may be a full-time firearms instructor, but the first thing is you should be a student. Because there's always once you once you get to the point where I've got nothing left to learn is you need to come up with a different trade. Um, so my advice would be learn how to effectively teach uh, the adult learner. And yeah, that yeah. And be good at your trade and always be a student. Yeah. And it, Mike Seekland and I, when we do our firearms instructor development course, that's one of the things, you know, it. We say it's small on the firearms, but we're, we're going to teach you how to teach any subject to an right. adult learner. And, and um, that's the whole thing as an instructor. You're, not, that, you're right. not out there to show how good you can shoot. Exactly. Uh, a lot of times you, you really don't want to do that because, you know, if you just keep going out there shooting, you know, because your student is, you know, putting a shotgun pattern on a target at seven yards and you're like, no, do it like this. And you're drilling everything down the center. That student's just going to get frustrated, embarrassed. It's not your job. Your job is not just to show them how good you can shoot is to teach them how to shoot mm -hmm. and teach them to shoot better than you can. If it's, if it's possible. Yeah. Uh, Monday, this coming Monday on coffee with Richard, we're going to have on Karen Whitlock, who's a phenomenal, uh, do you know, Karen? 
I do not. Uh, yeah. I understand she's a few hours north of here up in northern Georgia. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, she's going to be on uh, Monday, and she's a phenomenal instructor, and I look forward to picking her brain as well, Tony, as uh, everything that you bring to the table. But I think your point about understanding how the brain works, it does no good. Like, well, I like to teach like this. Well, it doesn't. Who cares? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like you said, it's not about you. It's about your student and how right. your student's going to take that information. Ted has an interesting comment, Tony. He says, I deal with friends wanting something free, just basic help, but they make much too hard to arrange. No credit for prep time required of me, et cetera. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I think is important, like I, I don't want to teach anything for free, not because, you know, it's stingy. It, it's, I don't need the money. What the point of it is, is there has to be value. You have to exchange something, you know, you have to want it. And if you're like, okay, yeah, man, you, you can come take an hour. It's going to cost you X, X, Y, and Z. Then you're going to value that training and say like, yeah, Rich is going to take me to the range. We'll probably plink off some mountain rounds. No, no, no. It reminds me of, uh, see, you were, you did some Okinawan karate, right? Yes, sir. Okay. As did I. And of course, did you ever go to Okinawa? I did not. That was, uh, I don't remember if I put that as my first choice to go to was Okinawa because I, I was training in Okinawa and karate, uh, Shuri Ru at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, yeah, you know, that's, that's where my martial arts comes from. I want to go to Okinawa. Now you're going to the, you're going from Pendleton back to Lejeune. So, <laughs> well, having spent six months on Okinawa, one of the, uh, and I did Ishin Ru karate, of course, it's mm -hmm. from Okinawa, Master Shimabuku. Master Shimabuku, when he was a little boy, he went up to his uncle that this is, the legend, right? He goes up to his uh, uncle who knew uh, Okinawan karate. And he's like, I want you to teach me. And the uncle, uh, I want you to teach me karate. And the uncle just looked at him, spit in his face. <laughs> Next day he comes back. I want you to teach me karate. And as the legend goes, the uncle beat the crap out of him. The third day he comes back, you know, battered and bruised and says, I want you to teach me karate. And he's like, you know, bows at him. He's like, okay, we can start. But I mean, Miyagi going on there. What's that? A little Mr. Miyagi going on there. I guess, you know, some serious reverse psychology or whatever. But, <laughs> but the point is, like, how bad do you really want it? And uh, there's another uh, martial arts uh, story that you may be familiar with, Tony, where the, and, and I'm making this about instructor, not necessarily about martial arts, but I think there's a, there's a lesson here where the, um, he, the student comes to the master and says, yeah, master, I want you to teach me. And he says, yeah, that's, that's great. And he goes, yeah, and I want to be a black, black belt. How long is it going to take me to be a black belt? He's like, uh, well, standard is about four years, He's like, but, I'll, but I'll train twice as hard. Oh, you'll train twice as hard? Okay, eight years. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'll show up every single day. Oh, wow. Okay, 12 years. He's like, why, why are you doing that? And he says, because you're losing sight of what the, the true meaning is. It's not about a belt. You know, you, you need to just come and train. The more you focus on that, the farther away it's going to become. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so I think there's some truth there. And 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 it goes back to something that you said a little while ago, Tony. I, I, I wish I would have had you unpack it then, but I would ask you to unpack it now. And that's something you said. You said, I thought I knew how to shoot when mm -hmm. I got to Marine Corps boot camp, and I, and I found out that I didn't really know. Can you unpack that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, while I was on the team, after our uh, after the sniper that was on there, who was also a Marine, got killed. Uh, you know, obviously we needed somebody else. There was there was two of us. Uh, obviously, as as a medic, being a counter sniper wasn't my number one job. But you know, we're a small team, so you know you got a lot of cross training in there with everybody. So you know, I like I said, I, I grew up shooting and hunting. I knew my way around a rifle and that was, I was good at it. I could put a, a scope on something on a rifle that I had dialed in and I could put the rounds on target from, you know, hundred plus yards. Well, that's with a scope bolt action rifle and whatever you get to the Marine Corps. Now all of a sudden you're using a, an M16 A2 with iron sights and, and a sling and you're shooting out to 500 yards that, you know, you, you can barely see the target and uh, just the way it was broke down. That's, that's the thing. Um, and I think what you're alluding to is the fact that, uh, you know, you've got people who, who buy guns and they shoot. Okay. Um, 
So they don't need an instructor. They don't need anything to go out to the range, buy a box of rounds, and just sling lead down range, and they think they know how to shoot. Once, uh, once somebody comes along and, and, and you're challenged, okay, now you've got to do this in this amount of time, and you don't know what you're doing because you were never taught the basics. And that's what the Marine Corps does. Uh, that's what they've always been known for is, is teaching people how to shoot that basic. So what I went, uh, was talking about is the, the service rifle competitions. It's basically Marine Corps qualification. Uh, it, it is nothing but a test of basic marksmanship fundamentals. And that's what the Marine Corps does. So, you know, all that stuff about natural point of aim and, and breath control and trigger control, all that stuff that, you know, I just took for granted, didn't know what it was. But now all of a sudden they teach you how to take this rifle in a small caliber 5.56 five, and put rounds on target at 500 yards Yeah, you know, with no scope. Which I'm like, I don't, I, I, no scope. <laughs> How do I do this? You know. So, and it's the same thing with, uh, and I think uh, somebody made a comment uh, about that, uh, and it might have been, might have been Dr. Fuller. I'm not sure, but you know, they'll put all this time and effort and money into winning a plaque or a, a belt or something like that, but they won't spend money on learning uh, correct marksmanship or. And not just marksmanship, but but gunfighting as as much as you can without being in a gunfight. Uh, you know that our Marine Corps qualification no more prepares us for combat than an agency or an institution's qualification course in a firearm. It's not teaching them anything to do with with combat shooting or surviving in a gunfight. It's it you know all of that is is sadly lacking in that area it's just teaching them how to safely load discharge and unload a firearm in you know a relatively liberal amount of time and that's pretty much all they get so you know in their mind that well i know how to use a gun so i'm, I'm good to go strap this on my side and let's go hit the street every day no, excellent points. Excellent points. And I, I tell people that, you know, like uh, Marine Corps recruit training, 13 weeks, you spend an entire week, as you know, Tony, grass week, <laughs> grass week mm -hmm. just sitting around a white barrel, uh, snapping in with your rifle for an entire week in yeah. the heat of uh, Paris Island, South Carolina, getting eaten by m bugs and mosquitoes and you can't move, you can't scratch. And it is a, Zill Miller wrote a book. Everything uh, the name of the book was "Everything You Need to Know I Learned in the Marine Corps." And Zill Miller w was the uh, uh, one-time governor of Georgia, mm -hmm. and he wrote an amazing book. And um, the first thing is, is he talks about how the sand flea taught him discipline. <laughs> and I thought, what a it's a really interesting chapter and a really neat book. I would encourage everybody to, to check it out. It's a very small book. I want to ask you also, you know, what I ask you, what advice you would give to the new Leo? Let me ask you this, Tony, what advice would you give regarding tactical emergency medicine? Maybe not to a new practitioner, but what is a great little nugget of advice that would really help the viewer this morning or someone listening on a podcast uh, with regard to tactical or emergency medicine? Man, that's hard because I've been out of that game for, for quite a while and you know, as you know, and everybody else that's ever been involved in anything like that knows that, you know, it changes, it, it evolves, it ebbs and flows a lot. I mean, there were so many changes that happened while I was in. A lot of things they're doing now that uh, we never did. TAC med, you know, that came out with that term was was never a term when uh, when I was doing it, when we were doing it. Um, one of the biggest things that I learned is, it all goes back to situational awareness. I mean, if you're in that environment, you've got to know what's going on around you. Um, you know, now TACMED is something that's given to probably most law enforcement officers on the street. It kind of has a different meaning than it used to. As everybody's now, you know, learn how to put a tourniquet on themselves, on their partner, stay in the fight while you're doing it, this and that kind of stuff. You know, when I was a paramedic, Tourniquets were a no-no. You know, you didn't use a tourniquet unless it was the, you know, decision of life or limb. 
And of course, as we know, medicine changes. Where does the where does our growth, our biggest growth in uh, pre hospital medicine come from? Always comes from combat. Yeah. You know, Vietnam changed a lot of stuff uh, for pre hospital medicine here in the States. I mean, they're really prior to that, there wasn't a whole lot more than funeral homes truck that you went out and loaded in the back, jumped in the front and drove to a hospital. There wasn't any, there wasn't any pre-hospital medicine. And Vietnam really kind of changed all that. Uh, current conflict is obviously done, done a lot because now, you know, tourniquets are one of those things, you know, if in doubt, just put it on. Yeah. And, you know, tourniquets are great, but I think, I think people kind of lose sight of, oh, everybody's got to have a turn. You know, you're on these different forums, you know, all these guys, you know, the preppers, the bug out baggers and all these people. And, and everybody wants to be a, a medical expert. I got to have a tourniquet. Got to have a tourniquet for every limb, this, that, and the other thing. That's the only thing they think about is a tourniquet. All right. You know, in, in the 14 years total that I was in EMS, I never needed a tourniquet. I never had a, an extremity that hemorrhaged that I was not able to control that that bleeding and in the short time that it was going to be for him from where I was at with my patient until they got to the hospital. What people don't, and I know you've talked about it before, uh, what people don't realize is the much bigger target is the thoracic region. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't put a tourniquet on that. You know, people don't realize that the chest seals, you know, checking for the, for entrance and exit wounds and, and making sure you seal both, keeping, you know, a, a pneumothorax at bay, that kind of stuff is probably a lot more important than, than just worrying about tourniquets. So, uh, but now, you know, with the, with the TAC med, I, know I got up on a tangent there, but with, with the TAC med, you know, back, say back in my day, but back then, most police officers didn't even have a first aid kit. I don't, I don't know what you had when you were, when you were doing that, but you know, in the eighties, Police officers, they didn't, they didn't do first aid. You know, they, they called for EMS and that was about the extent of what, what their training was. Now, uh, you know, law enforcement, everybody's getting a lot more, a lot more first aid, a lot more first responder training, and they've got a lot more equipment that they can use. So, uh, again, the, that piece of advice, I mean, it just depends on what, what area that you're working in that you're going to be applying, applying those techniques. But obviously if you're having to do some kind of tactical medicine, you're probably in a situation where you might want to think about getting out of. Yeah. I'm, I, we'll take a couple of comments here, Tony. Uh, but before we do, Dr. Fuller says, Rich, when you first went in, were you trained in the me medicinal use of leeches? Uh, <laughs> Yes, and before we put them in the wagon, okay, to, to take yeah. them back to the farm. Uh, that and bloodletting. Exactly. Leeches and bloodletting were the, were the uh, thing of the day. Um, I want to get to William's point. William says, nope, not taught. Tac med, you go get the instruction on your own like everything else. Wow. So I, I think uh, William is a law enforcement officer. And uh, to your point about what it was in my day, I was very fortunate. I had a forward leaning department. We had, uh, I mean, we had uh, cameras in the cars in the, in the mm -hmm. early to mid nineties. I, uh, when I went to the police Academy, they had a thing where if you wanted to, your department could pay for you, not only to get your, um, get post certified as a law enforcement officer, but also your EMT license. So every night and on most weekends, we were doing EMT related things to get our license. So when I graduated the, Police Academy, I was also got my licensure. So I did, I carried a unit one medical bag in the back of my patrol car and I responded to ambulance calls as well. So that was pretty unusual for the yeah, time. And that was, that was uh, when you say the early mid nineties is when mm -hmm. they were really starting to come up with that tiered response system yeah. where we didn't have any of that before. We didn't have any of that. I mean, I was involved in more domestics, more fights as a as a medic than I ever was as a cop, because whoever starts losing that battle, they'll call an ambulance. Why? Yeah. Medics don't carry guns and they can't take you to jail. And all of a sudden, you know, law enforcement, you know, you get called for a laceration. Well, you don't know how that laceration called, you know, 
uh, was caused. Exactly. And you show up and you're smack dab in the middle of a brawl. And it's funny you say that, uh, Tony, because I remember when you would hear an ambulance call go out at certain houses, you just start rolling that way because you know what's <laughs> going on. We yeah. have the same thing. It's like, this ain't going to be an ambulance call. It's coming out that way, but this ain't what it is. Somebody's going to the hospital. Somebody's probably going to jail. Exactly. Uh, Dave Brothers is on. Good morning, Dave. He says, what are some ways you fit training into your everyday life? Oh, wow. Um, A lot of reading, uh, obviously, a lot of you know, a lot of dry fire working with that. You know, part of my business is is, is gunsmithing. I, I build guns, I work on firearms, refinish them, do all that. So, so the firearms part is you know pretty much something that I'm thinking about every day. Something that uh, something I'm doing. So, and I think. I think the mental aspect of it has a lot to do with it. If you're thinking about what to do, uh, you know, again, we talk about the mind and we talked, I know a lot of people are familiar with Lanny Basham and his book with winning in mind, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he talks about the, the brain. And I know Dusty Solomon does in his book, the brain doesn't know the difference of whether you're actually doing it or just projecting it. that as long as uh, as long as you're putting that information into your brain, it's it's trying to store it. And the more you think about it, the more the brain realizes, hey, this is important stuff. We need to put this back here in the in that procedural memory. That's funny. Yeah, I, one of the most interesting things I, I ever now and then I'll just watch myself tie my own shoes and realize <laughs> that I'm not putting any conscious thought in it. And right the fingers are just moving on their own or making the knot. And I'm just looking at that going, it's almost like it, it's running a script that I'm not aware of. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that's obviously where we want our shooting and combatives to be right, Tony. Right. Right. Exactly. That. And you know, if you have to, if you have to think about it, you're, you're way behind. Yeah. And, and there's also some, I've heard some tier one guys talk about it. Like I don't have any PTSD. I don't have any PTSD. And and they equate it to the fact that they were just running a script when they went into a room guy right. with gun, bang, bang, bang. He goes down. Oh, did I just shoot somebody? Yeah. You know, yeah, that's so, what I'm supposed to do so. Yeah. So there's no emotional anguish. I didn't have to consciously look in somebody's eyes and think about the, the long-term implication, even at the millis millisecond level, it's just, now I'm running a script. Right. And Dr. Fuller says unconscious competence is the goal. Yep, spot on. Absolutely right. Um, I have another question for you, Tony, while I got you on here this morning, as you've been watching, just like every other American, the events unfold in Afghanistan, what are your, what thoughts come to your mind? Uh, um, it's, you know, I, I see a lot of comments. I don't know if it was a case of gross incompetence or planned incompetence. I, I just, I just can't imagine that we have a government that is so stupid to have done what they did without realizing the consequences. And if they did realize the consequences, what's the end game? We right. just gave 85 billion dollars of some of the best weaponry and technology to our enemy. They used to call that treason. Uh, so it's sad. And, and it's, you know, what's going to happen? We just made the Taliban, who's now taken over a country and become their legitimate government, so to speak. We just armed them like a first world nation. Yeah, some somebody said that they have uh, they have a larger air force now than Spain. I don't know if that's true or not. I haven't looked into it, but I have no idea. But they probably got a larger air force than than a lot of places. And of course, what was one of these? Oh well, you know. And I know you've made the comment that uh, you know a lot of those guys couldn't even read. So there's no way they're going to learn how to you know be able to fly our Blackhawks and stuff like that. Well, what comes out a few days later? They're flying around in Blackhawks, hanging people by the neck underneath of them in our Blackhawks. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, it, and here's the thing. Anger, uh, anger comes to mind for one. Yeah. Thing. 
Yeah, I know. I, I, I'm trying to be uh, rational and reasonable ab about it, uh, Tony, but I like you and most Americans, I'm pretty upset about it, you know, because, okay, yeah, the Taliban, most of them cannot read. That's true. And 99.99% and of them have zero idea on how to even, you know, uh, turn the gyros on in a, in a Black Hawk. However, that we did... Perfect we did train Afghan nationals or the, it doesn't take much to hire somebody to, tr to train that mm -hmm. or it takes nothing to sell those things. Mm -hmm. And, and here's the thing. I, I like triangulating the news. We've talked about that a lot. You can't just get all your news from Fox. You can't just get all your news from CNN. So I'll go out and look at Reuters. I'll look at BBC. And mm -hmm. last night I was looking at, I can't remember the name, but it was the Indian, uh, in India, what they're saying about it. And I mean, they were really hammering uh, our administration and they were the disgust in the female news presenter was completely unmasked. She's like, what did they accomplish in 20 years? They overthrew the Taliban in 2002 to replace them 20 years later with the, the Taliban. Taliban. And when they overthrew them, they had a couple of rusty Soviet pieces of equipment, a ZSU, maybe a, a, a BTR somewhere rusting on an airfield. Now they have first world weaponry and lots and lots of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know how, if you're watching this, whether you're an Indian like this woman was, a uh, Brett like uh, watching the uh, BBC, Everybody has the same opinion, and, and that, that's our allies. So imagine what our enemies are perceiving this as, Tony. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what's, you know, what's stopping, uh, for instance, you know, China going ahead and saying, okay, this, this is the time. We're going to reclaim Taiwan. Uh, or anybody else, you know, uh, What's going on with uh, Russia and Ukraine? What our enemies, you know, they're like, ah, well, you know what? It's game on. We, we just saw what, what the United States isn't going to do, what they're not going to commit to. So let's go ahead and do what we, we've been wanting to do and putting off because worried about the response the U.S. would have. Yeah. Uh, in 1959, of course, we signed the... Uh the defense treaty that we would come to Taiwan's aid in 1959. And then uh, we tore up that treaty in 1979 when we started getting in bed with Beijing, but we did r draft another, and I can't remember in 1979, same year Congress put together some other resolution that we'd come to their aid, but you know, Japan is nervous and uh, the prime minister of Japan is stepping down. So we don't know what kind of government we're going to get when uh, the prime minister of Japan steps down. But I will tell you that everyone in the Asia Pacific theater is is kind of trembling right now as America withdraws from Afghanistan. Dr. Fuller says it's scary for the Indians because a lot of that weaponry is going to end up in Pakistan. Well said. And uh, and of course, we have India and Pakistan, both nuclear armed countries, both sworn enemies. And now to Dr. Fuller's point. We're going to have a really well armed Pakistan now. Yeah. Well, I mean, Taliban basically runs both of those countries of Afghanistan and Pakistan, don't they? Pretty much. I mean, you know, when you have bin Laden sitting in Pakistan, you know, a few hundred yards from their biggest police or military academy, and Pakistan's supposed to be an ally of ours during that war, and, you know, he's there for how many years? And nobody knew he was there. Ah, come on. Well, Pakistan, of course, is, is may have been an ally at one point. They're definitely not now. If you uh, read the statements that uh, the prime minister of Pakistan was releasing as the uh, Kabul was falling, he, he's cheering that the Taliban has mm -hmm. broken the shackles of slavery or some euphemism to that effect. Yeah. Uh, so they're, they're giddy right now with what's going on there. And, uh, and we, it's going to shift around a lot of things. And I think we've, we're just weaker as a nation for that. You know, we, we, let me ask you this as a, as a former Marine, Tony, what are your thoughts on Stu Scheller? I know I didn't intend on asking you this, but uh, do you have any thoughts on Lieutenant wow. Colonel Scheller? Um, I didn't catch his, uh, all of his uh, second video. 
But what he did was either incredibly brave or incredibly stupid. Um, and it's it's hard to tell. I mean, I I would like to think that, uh, you know, he did all of this out of the utmost integrity and being sick and tired of what's of what's going on and and spoke out against it. I, you know, the words he in his first video is, you know, hey, our leaders need to be held accountable somewhere up the chain needs to be held accountable. You know why? Well, I can get off on that, but but you know I I think he wants answers, and I think he knew going into it he wasn't going to come out unscathed. You know he was immediately relieved from duty. He knew he was going to going to do that uh, that that was going to happen to him. So uh, he he probably spoke what a lot of Marines were feeling. And probably a lot of other service members as well, yeah, as well. You know, like what the hell did we just do? Why, you know, why were we there for 20 years? I mean, his entire career, 17 years, has has been during the time that we were at war. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, I was uh, I was already long in the tooth when the planes were flown into the twin towers. I was a gunnery sergeant already, so. Uh, but, you know, like your point, Lieutenant Colonel Scheller, his entire career mm -hmm. was during the GWAT. And uh, you could see it in his face when he uh, and he knew he was committing career suicide. And, and yeah. a lot of people don't know this about Stu Scheller. He already had he was already a multimillionaire as, a, as an entrepreneur and business owner on the side. I didn't know that. I, I, yeah. I know uh, during his second inter or a second uh video that he put out he talked about you know i, I don't know what's going to happen with through my you know the marine corps or my entrepreneurial shit. that kind of struck me when i heard that but i never had a chance to actually dig into it and see what what that was all about but i figured he had a, a side hustle going on there of some type so yeah. didn't realize it was of that magnitude yeah he, he's got a serious side hustle and, and good for him but i think that Having financial freedom will give you the ability the ability to speak truth to power. You know when you're not Absolutely. beholden to anything. And uh, th you know, makes, no go ahead, Tony. Sorry, I said that just makes a lot more sense of what he did. Uh, you know, I didn't realize the magnitude that he had when I made the statements either incre incredibly brave or stupid because it was the stupid side was I've got three years left for retirement. I can keep my mouth shut for three years and then come out and say it. But like you just said, he's not beholden to that pension. He Okay, he lost his pension. Apparently, that really doesn't hurt him that much. So, like you said, he can come out and speak the truth. Hey, if I get canned, I get canned. It's, it's not a lot of skin off my back financially, so I'm going to say what needs to be said. Yeah, and, you know, an interesting thing is uh, we're not hearing much about the 90 general officers retired who have come out and called for the resignation of uh, the SecDef Austin as well as the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, General Miley. Milley. Milley, Miley. Miley, Milley, whatever it is. Um, but they make a really good point. I was reading this morning on the Daily Mail out of the, out of the UK, and uh, their, their point the general officers make is, you either didn't warn Biden strong enough, i.e., just like uh, Lieutenant Colonel Scheller said, you know, threw your rank on the table like, sir, we cannot give up Bagram. This is a bad plan. I'm prepared to resign if you want me to execute this plan and you can find somebody else that'll do it for you. Or you said it's great and you did it knowing it was a bad plan and you should be relieved. Either way, you should resign. And uh, I tend to agree with that. What do you think, Tony? I do. I, I do agree. Uh, you know, and we haven't heard much. We, we heard a little bit about those those uh, retired general officers that uh, what was it a couple of months ago when they came out and, and talked about how bad this administration was doing, was calling for resignations. And then haven't, I haven't heard much about those guys since. Uh, I don't know. They're not making waves anymore. Or, they just released that statement. Uh, they? Yeah. Like two days ago. Or, uh, you know, because it's opposition to the current administration, are they just not getting the press? I think it's, I think it's that they're not getting the press. That's why I found it this morning on the, mm -hmm. in the UK. Uh, where is all this lawlessness going? I wish I knew. Uh, 
what again what what is the what is the end game i mean if if 2020 didn't teach us something with all of the the riots not only that there were riots but you know they were organized they were funded you had people like kamala harris uh getting funds for bail for the protesters they peaceful protesters of BLM and Antifa to get them out of jail the, the same night they were arrested. Why? Why are we allowing that? Why Why are our elected officials even calling for it? Because we've heard, we've heard several of our elected officials call for it. Um, so you know what what is their point for that what what is the is the end game do they want this divisiveness do they want us divided fighting amongst ourselves so you know we don't see what the what the left hand's doing over here while the right hand's fighting each other you know what are what are they trying to get out of it and every time something like this happens what do they do they try to impose and limit more freedoms and liberties on the folks that had nothing to do with these riots. So I, I know one of the questions you were going to ask, uh, you know, if you're going to get to it, is about the erosion of freedoms. Uh, I absolutely agree. It, it, we're definitely, I mean, look what they're trying to do to the Second Amendment and have for how many years? You know, 70, 80, 90 years yeah. that, that they have, uh, you know, tried to do everything they can to restrict our our freedoms and our, and our liberties. And I, I know I saw one thing that somebody posted is, uh, you know, your gun control edict is, is null and void now that you just gave, you know, what is it, 60,000 plus automatic weapons to the Taliban? 600,000 600, rifles. Yeah, yeah I, but I, I think there were 600,000 rifles and I saw 64,000 fully automatic machine guns like the 240s and such. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and, you know, you're worried about, you know, whether a, a pistol brace makes my pistol a rifle and now all of a sudden, you know, I'm a most wanted felon. Uh, so, I mean, and, and it's true. There, there's, there's no debate. There, you cannot have a debate on gun control after what, the left, which is one always calling for gun control, what they just did. You know, um, and it goes back to, you know, what else has gone on with, uh, I don't know how you feel about, you know, this pandemic. And I mean, what they had done during this time. Now, is there is there a flu out there? Sure there is. Can't deny it. Um and it is a flu. We have a flu every year. This is a, a worse strain of flu. Absolutely. But you know what? They never in the history of the United States that I know of have they arbitrarily locked down people in their houses, forced them to wear masks, trying to force them to take a brand new experimental vaccine that doesn't cure it, doesn't keep you from getting it, doesn't keep you from spreading it decided, the government decided what businesses that they're going to close and what families they're going to ruin who now can't pay their mortgages, their rent, food, other things. And But at the same time, they let all the, the big box places stay open. Makes you wonder, why is that? Well, uh, you know, one theory is, is that every one of these places that they allowed to stay open have shareholders. Small mom and top stores, they don't have shareholders. The only people they're going to ruin is, is the people that own that business and whatever employees they had. They're not going to have to answer to a whole bunch of, you know, people that own stock in, in Walmart or, or Home Depot or whatever that's, you know, hey, mom and pop, Walmart store, you got to close. You need it, ain't go to Home Depot, it'll be open. Who are they to say what, who is a uh, important business and who's not? Right. So, you know, the, the whole loss of liberty thing, I, I mean, people are, you know, and it wasn't even law. This is just governors 
making mandates and mandates aren't law. But yeah, I want to talk to the to the COVID thing and, and loss of liberty specifically. Um, while I don't necessarily agree that it's the flu, uh, I would push back on that. Um, but I think your point about loss of liberty is something I wholeheartedly agree with. And, and let's take the emotion out of it and let's look at another Western country, and that is Australia. Oh. While you were talking, uh, I was doing a little research. Currently, since the pandemic began, Australia has had 1,032 deaths as of this moment from COVID-19 in all of its variants, 1,032. That's it. At the last time we had uh, data in Aust for Australia for people that die in automobile accidents a year, it's 1,194 uh, was in 2019. So more people are killed on the roads driving than, than have been killed in 18 months of this pandemic for Australia. And yet they're not outlawing cars, no. but they are locking people away and saying you cannot even walk outside your house to get a breath of fresh air or watch a sunset. Uh, I don't know if you saw that Australian news. Uh, I forget who it was that got, I think it was the health minister of Australia got on there. It's like we, they went and arrested some people for walking on the beach by themselves, social distance, just to watch the sun rise or sunset. I can't remember. And he was calling them selfish and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, guys, come, what are we doing? Do we so, really want to lose these liberties over this? They were doing the same thing here. How many, how many videos that went viral? Did you see of people, you know, even out in California on the beach getting arrested. They're out by themselves. And, and, and you know, the example that you, you just gave, they're by themselves. You know, they're probably a couple that live together. So, you know, what's the difference? They're out there by themselves getting fresh air. Nobody else is around. And what do they do? They come and arrest them and throw them into a confined space with a bunch of other people. Now, what is more likely to cause a, sp a spread of a virus? walking on the beach by yourself or have an interaction with law enforcement officers and now getting thrown into, into jail, confined air and space of, of who knows how many other people. Absolutely. It, it makes no sense to me. And I think that the, the, the way that the Australian protesters have done it, it should be a model. And that is they just, they're walking to the park. They just want to go to this large park in the center of town they got their hands up. I'm not hurting anybody. I just want to go to the park. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a beautiful moral way to frame it because this is, we're talking about a country uh, folks of 20, over 25 million people, over 25 million. And we're talking about a thousand and 32 people uh, dead from COVID. So we're talking about 0. 0.00000 yeah. bunch of zeros, something and for that, we're willing to, to lock down and lose all of our freedoms. It just doesn't, it doesn't pass the sniff test. I don't, I'm not saying there's a nefarious agenda. Maybe there is. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out in well, hindsight, but it does beg the question. Does it not, Tony? It does. I mean, what other reason is there? You, you can't, you can't say that the actions that they have taken is about your health or safety. Even in the United States, there are, the cause of death every year, there's a lot more people dying every year from a lot more causes than what COVID-19 has done. Um, so, you know, like, like you said, there's, there's more people die in traffic accidents a lot. I don't have the statistics, but I know there's a lot more people dying in traffic accidents here. Uh, heart disease, uh, stroke, cancer, uh, all sorts of other things a year than, than COVID and they're not banning cars, you know, uh, we're not banning uh, fried chicken and, <laughs> and biscuits and, and gravy, cold, right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and why is that? Because that's a personal choice, you know, just, just like this should be a personal choice. Okay. Here's what we know about it. If you get it, you're going to get pretty sick. So you're now, you've now been advised, it's now your choice to do what what you want to do, and if you get sick, well, you were warned. So that's that's the freedom of choice. That's you know, that's what our uh, you know our liberties are supposed to be about. Yeah, they they hinge on that. I I completely agree, and that I think that that's part of the problem that 
a certain segment of the country is going to have when they, they have preached for so long, my body, my choice. And now <laughs> they're telling you now, now shut up and take your shot. It's like, wait right. a minute. Absolutely. You can't, you can't have it both ways. We have my body, my choice, and I have the freedom to choose whether I want this shot or not, but you can't absolutely. have it both ways. And you know, I, I don't, if you want to get it, get it. That is absolutely your decision. If you don't want to get it, don't get it. That's your decision. I'm not going to criticize anybody on either way. I know my feelings about it. Um, and that's it. But, but it does make you wonder if, if something was, was so good and so great, why do people have to be bribed and intimidated and bullied into getting it? You know, uh, how many, how many different States created, you know, like a, a million dollar lottery or whatever, you know, to get the, get the shot. Uh, you know, everything's free. Uh, well, it's all free because this is an illness and, and we need to get it under control. Okay. Well, why isn't insulin and chemo free? Yeah, that's a great point. It's not, it's incredibly expensive. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, it there, there, there's a lot of unanswered questions here and only time will certainly tell uh, what's going on here. But in the meantime, we'll circle back, Tony, if that's all right with you to sure. the self-defense aspect of this show. And that is, <laughs> I want to get your thoughts, my dear friend, on what can the average American listening to this show or watching today, what can they do to make themselves harder to kill? Stay out of the fight. And how do they do that? Uh, yeah. How do they do that? That's the question. Uh, and it, it comes back to, uh, Every time the situational awareness, uh, knowing your environment. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's about staying out of the fight. Yeah. We train and train that we'll know what to do if we're ever forced into that situation. But, you know, as, as non badge carrying individuals, we don't, we no longer have that obligation to run towards the gunfire. So, right. um, but yeah, uh, stay out of the fight. How do you stay out of the fight? You train. How do you train? You train not only in combative arms, but you, but you train in the situation, situational awareness. Uh, staying out of areas that you don't need to be in. When you're in the places that you have to be in, don't be staring at your phone or your laundry list of, of groceries and, and what have you. Be aware of what's going on around you. Be aware of uh, okay, if something happens, where can I go from here? You know, you walk into a into a store, like okay, the you know their back warehouse door is over there. I guarantee you, there's a way out back there. You know, or there's an emergency exit in the in the garden center or, or something of that nature. Knowing knowing how to get out of wherever you're at before you have to. Um, it's all that, that's all part of it. You now, as as most all of your other guests have said, you know, don't be walking around with your head in your phone. Be aware of what's going on around you when you're walking to your car with a, a buggy full of groceries. Yeah. Um, you know, just just that that type of thing. Be yeah. aware. I have videos of, have you seen? I know I've seen a bunch <laughs> of them where people are on their phone and fall into a water fountain or hit a light pole, you know, right between the, the headlights. Uh, don't be that person. I totally agree with you, my friend. I, I think that is, you know, the awareness piece is incredibly important. You just, you just covered that incredibly well. The run, hide, fight mantra for active shooters is, mm -hmm. is not bad for anything that breaks out. But in order to run, hide, fight, like you said, Tony, you have to know where the exits are. You have to know how to get out of every situation or place that you find yourself in. So, mm -hmm. That, that's incredibly well. I think a lot of times we stack up on the gun piece of the problem or the jujitsu or whatever, you know, that, that hard skill that is really sexy. But in reality, you want to make yourself harder to kill? Follow Stay Tony's advice, fight. man. Stay out of the fight. I mean, yeah. I to, you know, it's incredibly simple, but, and, you know, obviously that's, that will keep you probably out of 99.9% .9 of, of everything. It's being aware and stay out of the fight. You know, the fight you avoided is the fight you won. That's uh, right. Because, because once you're in that fight, there's no guarantees. There's, there's two things. Actually, let's make it three things. One is there's no guarantee. And attorney Andrew Branca, who wrote the book, The Law of Self-Defense, he's been a guest on this show before, 
a uh, good friend, he, one of his things is, you know, if you enter into that fight, there's a greater than 0% chance that you're either going to get killed or injured, or you're going to end up in prison for the rest of your life. So consider yeah. those odds. And a, another thing I want to unpack from something that you said too, Tony, was that, um, It has to do, unfortunately, it has to do with the current administration again. And I'm almost tempted to whether I'm going to bring it up or not. Let me think about that. I probably got a lot to say about it. Might not be yeah. appropriate for for a live conversation, but. Well, no, it's, it's um, one of the things I'm going to go back to a situational awareness, you know, because you kept talking about that. And one of the things that everybody needs to be aware, and I'm going to go ahead and go with it. And that is, is that they don't think like us, to quote the late Dr. William April. They do not think like us. And I say that because I kept hearing uh, President Biden continually say many, many times, if you go back and listen to his, his uh, remarks in the past few weeks, it's in the Taliban's best interest to do X, Y, and Z, right? To, to let the Americans out. It's in the Taliban's best interest, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Having been a uh, working in, working in law enforcement and corrections, I can tell you that inmates do things that are not in their best interest. They'll headbutt a corrections officer, even though you know you know that's going to add that's going to be an aggravated assault charge. It's going to add another six or eight years to your sentence. They don't care, guys. You know why? Because they don't think like us. No. You take you take an inmate uh, to to pull court security who spits on the judge right before the judge is about to to give them a lighter sentence. And now the judge is, you know, obviously upset. They don't think like us. The Taliban does not think like we do. And to say, well, it's in their best interest to do X, Y, or Z to me is, is faulty logic. Now I say all that in the context of, of what you were talking about, Tony, and that is we need to be situationally aware. We need to be aware that the person we may confront today in that Walmart parking lot does not think like us. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, who was the, uh, and I'm drawing a blank, who was the Marine general that said, uh, be kind, be courteous, be professional to everyone, but have a plan to kill everybody you meet. Uh, cool. You know, there's a, there's a lot to be learned in that, in that simple statement. I know a lot of people are going to take that the wrong way. You know, when you, when you bring that up, they're like, oh, you need me to kill everybody you meet because you don't know who that person is or what their intentions are. You, you don't live in their mind. Yeah. So, you know, once you get into that, you know, you let them into that, that circle of, of your personal space, everything you're going to do is going to be a reaction, you know, uh, of anything that's going to happen. So that, again, that's just part of situational awareness. So, you know, like you said, it, that person comes up to you at Walmart, you have no idea what they want. Somebody that you've never met before at 99.9 .9 times is probably going to be very innocent, but it's that 0.1% time that it's going to be a bad scene. That's exactly right. And uh, when we had Dr. William April on the show, he talked about interviewing criminals and uh he said, you know, he was talking to this group and like, uh, you know, we're looking for that white bag. We're looking for that white bag. And he thought they were being metaphorical. He's like, what are you talking about? What white bag are, are you looking for? It's like, well, you know, we'll be sitting in a car at the shopping mall and we're waiting for the white bag. And it's like, what do you mean? And what they meant was the bag from the Apple store was this big, white, beautiful bag. And, and he's like, okay, what about the white bag? He's like, well, for one thing, there's probably high end electronics inside the bag. But number two, that tells me a lot about the person. They're an Apple user. If they're an Apple user, they're probably softer than the average person. They drive a nicer car. They have a better house. And I was like, wow, they're, they're using all this psychology for victim selection. Yeah. So, so to your point, I think we need to do everything we can to, to deselect ourselves, to not be that soft target, to be cognizant of the fact that maybe we leave that white bag inside at the store and we put that electronic device in our purse or in our back pocket and walk out with our hands free. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's get yeah. to John. Let's get to John's point, Tony, because I, I think this is outstanding. John says in psychology, the false consensus effect, also known as consensus bias is a pervasive cognitive bias that causes people to quote, see their own 
behavioral choices and judgments as relatively common and appropriate to existing circumstances. He goes on to say, Tony, in other words, they don't think like us. Uh, psychology has recognized this for a long time. And of course, I think uh, POTUS uh, has fallen into that cognitive trap. Yeah, uh, I guess the question would be, why? Why don't they think like us? Or why don't we think like them? Why is there that difference? You know, where, where is that difference coming from? Is it coming from, uh, you know, our education system that is mandated by the government to go to a government controlled school for a minimum of 12 years? You know, you start when you're five years old and you're being indoctrinated to at least you graduate from high school, you know, and it wasn't, and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but didn't the states have total control over their education until Carter came up with the uh, Department of Education in the 70s? Is, am I mistaken in that? I've, I've heard that, Tony, but I don't know the veracity of that remark. But you know, the way it stands now is the government has the complete control over what's taught and, and what curriculum is taught in every school in the nation, or at least every public school in the nation. How is that ever a good thing unless the government or the administration or whoever the puppet masters are want people taught a certain thing and a certain way, no certain history and not other history? Um, what is it coming out? I saw where uh, somebody came out and saying that, uh, oh, well, it's not important for our kids to learn math. Are you freaking kidding me? Because it might offend them. You know, the, the person who's not good at math, they're, you know, they're going to be, it's going to hurt their feelings or something because they're not as good as somebody else in, in math. So it's, it's not important. What? <sighs> Meanwhile, we've got, uh, I don't know, other nations like China and, and Japan and other places, they're teaching their kids math and, and chemistry and calculus and everything. Why? Because they're going to get ahead in the world. Everything, you know, all of our technology is math. <laughs> we didn't have all this technology when I was in school. It's like math. What am I going to need math for? Well, I guarantee you, I've, I've used it my entire life in one form or another. Yeah, I agree. You know, uh, in Oregon, the Department of Education allegedly said showing that you, showing your work. Uh, for your math problems is a form of white supremacy. And, uh, you know, it, it's just, we're living in strange times, my friend. Yeah. I mean, who in a rational mind can even come up with that? Why do they yeah. come up with that? Yeah, I know. But to, to your point about uh, my good friend, Michael Gentile, who was on this morning a moment ago, I'm not sure if he's still on. Uh, I was telling him, uh, Tony, I said, I'm toying with the idea of putting my children in, in private school. I think they'll get a better education. I'm concerned with some of the things that are there being taught in the public school. And, and my friend just kind of looked at me funny and he's like, well, of course, I mean, your kids aren't going to school to learn necessarily. They're going there to be socialized. And he goes, it, it's, it's part and parcel of what they're trying to teach is socialization. And uh, if you want a good education, you're going to have to pay for it. And uh, I'm like, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I, and we did, we put our kids in private school and uh, they reaped the benefits for it. Absolutely. Uh, and I think Larry Elders, uh, who's running uh, in this Gavin Newsom recall election in California, and I really hope uh, Mr. Elders will get elected. I think he'll be the governor that California needs. I'm sure they'll be hamstrung. But, you know, he's a very big proponent for charter schools and giving parents vouchers and choice. I think that can make all the difference. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, public school, this isn't isn't what it used to be. Uh, you know, everybody knows or everybody should know or people our age knows that, you know, civics was replaced with social studies. <laughs> you know, why? You know, uh, our kids aren't being taught government, how the government is supposed to work, how, you know, how our country was, was founded, uh, the, where the Bill of Rights came from, where our Constitution came from, what were the Articles of Confederation, uh, you know, all that stuff, they're not being taught that. Why, why aren't they being taught all these things? Well, if you don't know your rights, it's easier to take them. If you're not, yeah. if, if you're not taught the importance of our 
you know, God-given natural rights, then it's easy to take them away. Uh, and I think you're right. I think especially if, if, uh, if nothing else, something 2020 taught us was kids don't need to be in a classroom. They can sit at home on a computer and learn, right? So why can't they be at home school? I mean, I realize that not every family can do that, but you know what? There's, there's probably people out there that can homeschool several people's uh, children, you know, get a community together and uh, pay that teacher to be their homeschool and be in charge of the curriculum that they're taught. You know, if you have that ability, then you can, you can say, okay, I don't like what you teach. So you're out of here. You're not teaching our kids, but you know, this teacher over here, yes, that's the curriculum we want our kids taught. We want our kids taught values and their freedoms and, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, you know, let's get focus back on that and, and history. There's probably a, a lot more options out there now, and I think 2020 shows that because why they kept all the kids out of school, set them behind a computer screen. Well, if that's just as good, then... Man, look at the alternatives that, that people probably have these days. Yeah, I, re I recently, Tony, I found my, uh, we called her memo, uh, you know, my memo's uh, uh, report card from the 1930s. She was born in 1921 and her, her report card from the 30s. And uh, the subjects, man, were insane. I'll have to find this thing, Tony, and put it on Facebook so people can take a look at it. Because it was, to your point, it was like, there's a curriculum for U.S. history. There was a curriculum for Tennessee history. There's a curriculum for U.S. government. And there was a curriculum for civics. And it was just like, wow, you know, none of these things are necessarily being taught. And if they are, it, it's, it's, you know, I would question what they're teaching. And, and Dave Brothers says a moral education is paramount. And I think that one of the things that a higher education should teach is not, not uh, you know, what to think, but maybe how to think. Exactly. And, you know, that's what, uh, that's what higher education used to be about. It was all about debate. It was about both sides. It was about critical thinking. Uh, now, no, it's about safe places and, and you're going to be taught this one way. And if, you know, if you're not a, in the vast majority of, of institutions, if, if you're not following the, the liberal ways, then, you know, you're, you're offensive and you're an outcast. There is no, to my knowledge, uh, any encouragement for debate on both sides to hear, you know, it used to be a place where free speech was, was the thing you, you could go to and question anything, anybody or whatever you had, you know, question the authority. Well, you can't do any of that. Now you're taught what to say, what to do, what you can't say, what you can't do. And unfortunately, and perhaps more dangerously, how to think. Mm hmm. Uh, John says, I have six kids. The first most important place for learning is in the home and the culture set at the home. Paying for private school is the equivalent of running from the fire instead of toward the fire. Don't shelter your kids. Prepare them for life in the world. We're raising adults who have to live in an adult world. And that's a that's a great point. I've, I had a friend once that always said this. He's like, I'm not raising a boy. I'm raising a man. Uh, because, again, that's the end state, right? We want to prepare those children, like John said, for for the future world that they're going to, to be in and let them know, like uh, we talked about a moment ago, not everybody's going to think like you do. Mm -hmm. So if, if we know they're not going to think like you do, mm -hmm. how do we communicate with that person? And I, I remember I've taught my kids how to interview, set them down and, and uh, we'll go through mock interviews before and they go and, and get the job. Because in school we teach them English for 12 years, but we never really teach them how to communicate. We teach them how to, where to put a comma, Mm -hmm. but never how to communicate with another human being, which uh, it always kind of blew my mind. I don't understand that. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And uh, I'm not sure that they're even teaching that anymore. Yeah. Uh, Gordon says it's not just as good. And our daughters have been in private in-person school throughout. So as we're wrapping up here, Tony, I've kept you on here for an hour and a half. I definitely want to be respectful of your time. I've really enjoyed this morning's conversation, sir. Where can people find you at? Um, on Facebook as uh, Bass Group 75 and on our website, of course. Now, our website is, uh, <laughs> that's really kind of been a bane of our existence for the past six months. We had 
we had a website up. We changed host and uh, we went to redo our, our website to include uh, like the custom leather holsters and so forth that I do and the leather work and, and our free strike boots. And lo and behold, something got downloaded that uh, just locked everything up, locked the computer up. We lost the website, everything else. So we're really working on that right now. We, we've got something up temporarily and it's uh, fastgroupllc.com. Uh, but, you know, on Facebook uh, or even on the on the webpage, it's got the contact information and everything. So hopefully we'll get a, a good working website up uh, sometime here soon. And awesome. The easiest ways. So firearms training, gunsmithing, leather work, freeze-dried food. Sounds like you guys got it all. <laughs> well, we're trying. It's uh Again, you know, I think diversity is, is kind of a key. Yeah, it is. Mark says, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Tony. Have a safe Labor Day weekend. Mary says, uh, great show, Rich and Tony. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Great show, Tony. I really appreciate you coming on this morning. Oh, it was my pleasure, my honor. Uh, I loved it. Loved it. Appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you, sir, because I think, you know, uh, I think the only thing that evil needs to triumph is when good men do and say yeah. nothing. So I think that uh, I appreciate you coming on here and, and having a really intelligent conversation with me this morning. No, I appreciate you having me, Rich. All right. Guys, stay safe. Have a wonderful Labor Day weekend. I'll see you Monday morning for another Coffee with Rich. We'll be talking with Karen. You're, Whitlock, you're not going to want to miss that show. Stay safe, guys. And remember that the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>